we only have like 13 minutes uh, left in this session, and I'm told that I need to be uh, on time. I'm only going to ask one question. I've been preparing this for some time, as you <laughs> might imagine. Uh, so I have lots of questions here, but I'm only going to put one question to the panel. Uh, and we don't need answers from everyone, but maybe someone who wishes to, to jump in on this uh, before I open the floor. And that is uh, the question, so what next? Uh, the, we've talked about the, this possibly indeed creating conditions that would allow the pursuit of a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which would have great great value. Folke Pat has suggested uh, steps that could be done in that process, but the question is, under the auspices of whom? Uh, who? How would that process be started? How would it be organized? Who would take the lead on that? Uh, would it be the United Nations, the United States, the EU? The EU has offered to host a peace conference. We've seen Egypt host a, a peace conference very, very early on that didn't get too far. But where, you know, how do we begin to work on a solution under what construct? Any ideas from any of you? What would be most promising? May I say that uh, any solution should start in Israel and in Palestine? Which means we now need a goodwill capital from Israel saying, I am in for a two-state solution. Because unless that is clear, any effort we're doing is going to be momentary. The willingness, of course, would need to be there on, on both sides. That's clear. But I'm just wondering, under whose auspices? Okay, One of the things, the auspices is, a, is an easy one. You can have it under the auspices of the United Nations. But the question is, who leads the conference? And I think if you don't have the heavyweights in, it will not lead to anything. I mean, remember 1991. If if at that time the U.S. hadn't been there, together with the Soviet Union, which was on its last breath, it wouldn't have gone forward. So it's very clear that the U.S. has to be at the head table and leading it and putting all its weight behind. And then you have to ask who are the main associates which the United States needs in the current geopolitical and regional situation. And here would say China has to be at the head table. There is no, I mean, you can add others, but China has to be there. And yet then you have to have the Arab states who already have peace with Israel at the head table. Um, we don't have to make peace between Israel and the Emirates or between Israel and Jordan or Israel and Egypt or Israel and Morocco. But these states have to be there as key mediators. When you say the main players in, that would that need to be at the head of the table in dealing with this, what about the elephant in the room? What about Iran? Well, the elephant has to be at the table, but not at the head table. <laughs> okay. So, so Iran does need to be part of this, and that, that would imply direct talks with Iran, which uh, would be an interesting prospect in itself. Um, I saw there was, you wanted to intervene quickly or, or not? Just quickly, yeah, and then I'm going to open the floor. Yes, very quickly. It's impossible to take a step to deal with Gaza if you don't also link it to where you're going after Gaza. Arabs will not create a force or be responsible for Gaza after all the devastation that occurred on the ground, unless they can argue this is a step towards the two-state solution. So there has to be not only a statement, also a linkage to where we're going towards the end of this. And let me just make, again, one my last point. You should not be surprised why the Arabs are looking at the West as being biased. You are biased. But the, the, what, what surprised people in the Arab world isn't your bias. It is how far that bias is when you stand up against a ceasefire, against uh, even humanitarian ceasefires. When you attend a war cabinet, then you can only blame yourself for the perception you leave. Okay, I, that was a, a reference to Joe Biden's uh, visit to, to Israel. Okay, we are going to open up the floor now. Uh, we, I see many questions on, on both sides. Uh, we'll start from, we'll go one in the middle, then to the right, and then to the left. So, sir. Uh, I'm Stan, Stan Cosmo from Capgemini. One observation and a question. Observation is that, to my knowledge, the last time there was a serious attempt at a two-state solution was 23 years ago, Bill Clinton, Ehud Barak, and Yasser Arafat. 
try to translate that today, clearly it can't be Netanyahu and Hamas. So it has to be a change in governance on both sides to make this happen with the support of, of this conference that you have been talking about. Now my question is, assuming fast forwarding to, let's say, March next year, assuming that this conference takes place with intent to have a two-state solution blessed by this community we mentioned before, what would that look like? It can't be Gaza plus Cisjordania, it doesn't make sense. So what could be the border between two states under this scheme? Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Just comment before we pick up one more. There was, I was going to the lady here and then to the gentleman in the third row and then, sir, we'll come to you, but not, not quite yet. We'll come to you in a moment. Uh, so the lady, I just want to point out that in the year 2000, during uh, Camp David, when Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat uh, met at, uh, in, in the United States, I was working for CNN at the time and it was one of the most uh, poignant moments of my life when we got... Um, Saeb Arakat on the phone walking out of the White House and I put the question to him, why are you walking away from this deal which seems so close to a, to a two-state solution? And he told me uh, the right of return of refugees. This is, I mean, there are multiple issues, but this is something that also I'm sure would have to be addressed along with the future of Jerusalem and, and the West Bank. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I uh, enjoyed the remarks that uh, Itamar Rabinovich said, which is, let's talk now about the day after. I have followed lately the, the, the comments of a, what he calls himself, a f f uh, next leader of the Palestinian uh, Authority, once Mr. Abbas passes away which is, I don't think would be very far. So he believes that there is no such thing as a two-state solution, that Netanyahu has killed it. So now we have to talk about the one-state solution. That's what he says. And he thinks that the beginning of this is to get Mr. Netanyahu out. I think that Mr. Rabinovich says exactly the same thing because they can have a new government. With a new government, it will probably be the people who are now demonstrating against Netanyahu who will form this new government and who will be much more amenable to uh, speak about the solution of the Palestinian question. Okay. Uh, if you, please ask your question because we only have five minutes left. Huh? Please ask your question. If you My have question. a question. Yes. No, if you have a question or if you have one, one quick comment in there, because we do want to allow no, others. I have yeah. a comment, not okay. a question. Please. What I just okay. said, Quickly. that this Palestinian leader Please. lives here. He's called Mohammed Dahlan. He has excellent uh, uh, connections with Israel, with Egypt, with, uh, with the ruler here. And I think that he should be put at the table and discuss what could happen because he has supporters inside Gaza. Thank you very much. Yeah, there, he's been giving uh, some interesting interviews that are uh, providing some insights. So now to the gentleman uh, who has his hand up, if we could get the microphone there, and then we're going to get some responses from the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, Hiro Akita Nikkei from Tokyo. Uh, just a two quick question about the long-term uh, geopolitical landscape. Question one, uh, what is the prospect of Abraham Accord paradigm? It, make, it seems to make sense to achieve, uh, you know, uh, Abraham Accord paradigm um, seems to make sense before October 7, but uh, now uh, Abraham Accord paradigm will get suspended unless two-state solution will get realized or it can go parallel. And second question is, uh, if Abraham Accord will be suspended, Accord, Abraham Accord trend will be suspended for maybe how in, in the meantime, how will Gulf state coexist with Iran? Thank you. Thank you very much. All, all relevant points and questions. We're going to just take these three first, get a response, and if we still have time, sir, we'll, we'll, be, we'll get to you. Um, so anyone on the panel like to take any of those points that were made? We've got a couple of things on the table. Um, very, very well. Please join us. Yeah. The floor is yeah. yours. Okay. So, uh, the key is to bring the Palestinian Authority back into the picture. 
First, if there is an interim arrangement in Gaza, be it Arab, be it international, it has to be temporary. And the Palestinian Authority that was expelled from Gaza violently by Hamas should return to Gaza and administer it. This should invigorate the Palestinian Authority and make it again a viable partner for Israel to discuss a long-range two-state solution. Put it on the agenda. Again, this would enable other Arab states or the Arab states uh, to join it. We don't have too much time. Remember, it's an election year in the United States, and uh, we don't have too many uh, too, too many months to uh, to wait until that that happens. So action should begin quite immediately. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. There was a question about what kind of two-state solution. If you, if I take you back, not only to the Camp David negotiations between Israelis. And, uh, and the Palestinians, and ultimately the Clinton parameters. But I even take you back to what you said earlier, the Taba talks. All of the details of every single item are dealt with there. There was no formal approval of these items for different political reasons. So my point really is, it's not about that somebody have to come up with a new formula for the border. It's 67, possibly with some minor exchanges <clears throat> or refugees. That's in the, uh, the, the Arab Peace Initiative, which talks about the return, uh, an agreement on return of refugees, uh, and so on and so forth, in including East Jerusalem. It's about the lack of political will. So what I was trying to say at the beginning is, let's put the essence in as much detail as we can of what the package would look like to resolve this once and for all. If it results in a change of leadership on one side or on both sides, ultimately, that's not my concern. My concern is the change moving towards peace between Arabs and Israelis, particularly Palestinians, rather than moving towards uh, a new cycle of violence. There is no permanent security if the conflict continues. Great. Thank you. Uh, then we will take one more question from the gentleman here in the second row, and that will be our last question for today. Then we're out of time. Bon, il me semble que tout le monde est d'accord pour une démarche diplomatique qui aboutirait à mettre les parties sur une même table et négocier. Mais n'oublions pas qu'il y a eu déjà plusieurs conférences, plusieurs réunions, pour ne citer que Camp David, Madrid, Oslo, qui n'ont pas abouti à la solution de paix telle que réclamée par les Palestiniens pour avoir leurs droits, c'est-à-dire un État palestinien avec Jérusalem Est comme euh, capitale, et cela, ces processus a échoué à cause de, euh, de la gouvernance du gouvernement israélien qui n'a pas suivi. Maintenant, ma question à M. Brahimovic, est-ce que les, euh, la crise de Gaza va faire prendre une prise de conscience en Israël pour aboutir à un pouvoir politique qui accepterait le droit palestinien à un État. Merci. Very good, yeah, Mr. Eber. I can answer that. Go ahead. Yeah, I can answer that. A public opinion polls in Israel show that 80% of the Israeli public lost their faith in the government. And uh, there is a debate whether you go through a change of government in the middle of a war, or do you want, you want to wait to the end of the, of the fighting. This could happen either through a new election or through other mechanisms that the Israeli constitution, constitutional arrangements. So I'm sure that sooner or later, there'll be a different government in, in Israel. 
if we find good partners on the other side. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, I'm afraid we are out of time. I, when I've been told not to go over, and I also know that some people have to catch a plane. <laughs> so uh, we're going to leave it here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks to our panel. A warm round of applause for a great discussion.